Hi, this is Bruce Rawls, and I'm speaking once again with Dr. Bob Rosenthal. Uh, Dr. Bob is one of the co-presidents of the Foundation for Inner Peace, and also a very longtime uh, student and teacher, of course, as well as being the author of several course-related books. Uh, you can find his work on Dr. Bob dash author.com and we're going to today talk about his latest book which is uh, from loving one to one love transforming relationships through a course in miracles i'm about 100 pages into it and i'm loving it <laughs> needless to say uh really wonderful uh a couple of the books that bob has written on a course in miracles are from never mind to ever mind uh, transforming the self to embrace miracles also highly recommended as is from Plagues to Miracles, uh, and then the subtitle on that is The Transformational Journey of Exodus from the Slavery of the Ego to the Promised Land of Spirit. And all three of these are just wonderful books. Uh, like I say, I'm only about 100 pages into uh, this new latest book, that, which is scheduled to be released on February 14th, 2020, if you're listening to the recording. February 4th, they moved it up. Oh, 4th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, good enough. <laughs> right. It, it was originally Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh, okay. All righty. Well, great. So anyway, um, without further ado, uh, Dr. Bob is a, um, you know, has had a long and distinguished career as a, as a psychotherapist and a psychologist, and, uh, it, and that, that work shines through even more wonderfully in this latest work that he's done, and uh, I can't say enough good things about it. So welcome, Dr. Bob, and, and where do you want to start? <laughs> oh, thanks so much, Bruce. Where do we want to start? Uh, I figure wherever we start, it's going to go where uh, Spirit wants, Holy Spirit wants it to go. So um, I think what I'd like to do is just, you know, give our, um, our viewers a little bit of a sense of like why this book and um, how it came. So uh, if you've heard any of our talks on, on From Nevermind to Evermind, you might already be familiar with some of this, but I was approached by a small publishing house to write a five book series on the principles of A Course in Miracles. And as I sort of trotted out the usual boilerplate about Helen and Bill and how it came and all of that, um, they sort of said to me, um, no, 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 we want something that would be uh, really appealing for people who don't know about A Course in Miracles or, don't, or have heard of it and don't know very much. And of course, I thought, well, that's fine. But I also, you know, as someone who's been doing this now for over 44 years, as of Christmas Eve, um, I obviously wanted to share my learning and understanding and insights from all of my study that would appeal much more to the uh, long-term seasoned students of the course. So I'm trying to deliver something that'll be helpful to everyone. And I had to ask myself, well, Principles of A Course in Miracles. Well, what the heck does that mean? And the first one that came to mind is if I had to st distill it all down, what is the fundamental teaching of A Course in Miracles? And I think the fundamental teaching is, um, who am I? The self that I think I made, this self-concept, is not what I am or who I am. And what I am is much, much bigger. And so I played with words in the first book and I said, you know, the never mind, if you will, is what we live through in the world. But behind that is ever mind, which is the oneness of the Son of God uh, and our true identity. And so the first book kind of looks at that and looks at, you know, what, what is the self? What is the world? Um, what is the mystical moment, which I call the perfect moment in that book? And then looks at this impetus we all have to join and how that sort of, you know, hits dead ends everywhere in the ego's world of form here, um, because no matter how big your group or how powerful the joining, it's always in opposition to something else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and realizing that we all want to reconnect in that oneness, but there's only one way to do it, and that is as, as spirit, not as bodies and personalities. So that was the first book. And then you know, I was like, okay, well, what would the follow on be? And that was also very clear. It has to be about relationship. Because, you know, as all of us who've studied the course know, forgiveness is one of its central underpinnings. But forgiveness is, you know, it, it, it always is in a relationship, even if the person you're working on forgiving died 
a thousand years ago and they're only in your head, or if they're a fantasy of what you thought, there is always that two-ness that we need to understand and get beneath as a oneness, which is the essence of forgiveness. And, um, you know, this, this played to a certain strength of mine because I've been a, a, a couples psychotherapist for, well, let's see, I did psychotherapy for over 30 years. I'd say for 25 of that, I was also doing couples therapy. Uh, it took me a few years to realize how important it was. Uh, so in this book, I wanted to sort of bring forth the course's ideas about relationship, holy relationship, special relationship. And then in the second part, really get into grievances and forgiveness and what is a grievance and where are they and what is really forgiveness and share a couple of what I find to be very, very helpful. Um, I'll call them techniques, but they're a little deeper than techniques. They're really sort of windows onto how to apply forgiveness. Uh, and, um, you know, because as I say in the book, what, you know, the ego sees relationships as arrangements that allow us to get things, qualities, people, uh, events, opportunities, experiences that we don't think we have on our own. So really relationships in the ego's mind are about plugging holes in your self-concept. Well, you know, I, I, I suck at math, but she's terrific. So I want to marry her, you know, right. uh, whereas in the Holy Spirit's view, every relationship is an opportunity to remember the true self, which lives in both of you and to remember it by recognizing it in your brother, as the course would say, um, or in your sister, uh, as we might say today, uh, as long as we don't get too hung up on, on gender. So I, I think that, you know, as I write in the book, we need to understand relationships are the crucibles for enlightenment. It's where we do the alchemical work, the deep work of undoing a self-concept in order to, um, you know, remove the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence and gradually begin to see the light shining through from us and from the other person and I assume ultimately getting to a place of recognizing that that's all that there is. And um, the first book, the title came to me fairly easily, brainstorming with my wife and my kids. The second book, I had a really hard time. I mean, I was going around and around. I was actually writing the book before I had the title. And I now understand that for me anyway, that's a problem. Because if I have the title, I have sort of a through line. I, I, I know it's like there's a spine to follow about what I'm writing with, and I can't wander too far from that. So on this one, it took quite a while, but I'm very, very happy with the title, From Loving One to One Love. Um, with all you know, due uh, deference to Bob Marley and the one love part. Uh, so... Loving one is what the ego does. I can only love one person. Um, I might love many people, but I love them as a separate individual unit. I love them for their specialness, what I think brings them to me. Uh, and, and of course, I also hate them for that, but that's much more buried. Um, you know, the Course speaks a great deal about this special relationship in, in chapter 16 in particular of the text um, and makes it really clear that you know, special love is a thin veneer for special hate, because if we think that we're inadequate and we need someone else to make us adequate, then we're dependent on them. And if we're dependent on them, we could lose them. And if we lose them, that idea makes us hate them uh, for exposing us as inadequate. So this goes around and around and around. The good news is when we dedicate our relationships to the purpose of the atonement, now they really do become these amazing vehicles for learning. Um, that learning can often be painful, but uh, it's, it's powerful. And um, I guess I'd finish talking about this by saying, this is where A Course in Miracles is, is I think, fairly unique among spiritual paths. It is clear it is only one of many, 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 and that is as it should be. 
but I don't know of any other paths that, that, that say, you know, the Holy Spirit's temple is not a body, but a relationship that you can't get there alone. To quote the Course, the lonely journey fails because it has excluded what it would find. What we're looking for is union. You can't get to union if you think you're a single individual all alone. So the primacy, the importance, the incredible vital significance of relationship, you know, we can't, we can't emphasize it enough. Uh, you know, it, it can't be overstated. And that's what I was hoping to get to um, in this book. Uh, of course, as always happens with me, once the book is finished and, you know, when I can't make any more changes, I find all of the best quotes in the course that I should have used. <laughs> The sequel, Becky. The sequel, right. Well, no, I think it's a good way of saying, hey, dude, in the ego's world of form, you aren't going to get to perfection, so let it go. Well, you could always tack them onto your website in reference to... That's a good idea. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> anyway, and then well, I did find plenty of, plenty of wonderful things that you've shared just in the first 100 pages that I've read so far. So Thank you. Yeah. Well, and, and, and when I read through it, I have to admit, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a really good quote. I'm glad I found that one. Huh, I forgot about that one. So, so I think it's, um, it, 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 I think it achieves what, what it needs to achieve. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I like how you, you, you know, begin by talking about, you know, the special love relationship, you know, early on in the book and, and how, you know, I, I, I humorously like to think that the, uh, parallel concepts to special love and special hate or in uh, infatuation and an in insinuation that, that okay. follows that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they're really, like you say, they kind of go hand in hand, the two sides of the same coin and, uh, and then how we have special love hate relationships with literally everything and everyone. Yes. And, uh, and, and, uh, and like you say, it's, it's really fundamental to uh, the working through the course. And, and if we were to go off and, you know, live in some kind of monastic life uh, in a, or in a cave somewhere, um, you know, we'd really be depriving of ourselves, ourselves of the, you know, the, the raw ingredients and the, and the, the classroom, as the course would say, for looking at how we undo the ego identification and, and do our forgiveness work, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the way I've come to look at it or understand it is I think if we go off to the cave, we can dissolve the body, ego, self, small s self, and completely rejoin with oneness. But that that has a limited, what the course would call transfer value, mm -hmm. in that because our focus is on self-transcendence, um, it can't generalize the way that A Course in Miracles came into being to achieve, which is, oh, well, as as I go, my brother goes, as my brother goes, I go. And if we do that in a relationship with two, I think it just has that much more power to ripple out through the collective mind of the sonship, bring about miracles and help other minds transform. Um, you know, when I am healed, I am not healed alone or, uh, or forgiveness lets me know that minds are joined. You know, we, we need to experience that joining. So it's not that sitting in a cave won't get you somewhere. But I, if, if the real goal is the awakening of the entire sonship, I, I think it's, it's limited in its uh, impact. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to say about just relationships in general in the context of what you wrote in the first part of the, you know, first third yeah. or so of the book? Um, so I think it's really important to remember that A Course in Miracles came into being as a result of a relationship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't um, someone like, you know, Muhammad going to a cave and receiving revealed wisdom. As powerful as that is, um, you know, it wasn't uh, Jesus preaching, you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount and some of his other works and that getting turned into Gospels, you know, a hundred years later. Um, it, it came directly in an extremely dysfunctional relationship between Helen Schuckman and Bill Thetford that was very much a special relationship because she was madly, crazily in love with him. 
and he could not reciprocate that as much as he, you know, respected and loved her in a more generic way. And they fought like, I mean, people say that just to be in the room with them sometimes was painful, that, <clears throat> that they would spark over the, the stupidest little things. Um, and how many of us, especially in marriages, have experienced that where, you know, you're you're fighting over something that then you realize is just totally absurd. Mm -hmm. So this is where Bill and Helen were. And, and you know, they were in an extremely uh, academic competitive environment where uh, it was truly dog eat dog and publish or perish. And Bill said to Helen, there must be a better way. And Helen said, I'll help you find it. And that's what brought A Course in Miracles into being. And so the course came first and foremost to help them heal their relationship and, um, and I think this is why so much of the early material was, was eliminated, edited out by them as quote unquote personal. The word personal didn't mean, oh my gosh, it's so embarrassing, nobody else can know it. You know, it's about our sex life or our lack of a sex life or whatever. It was personal and then it, it came to them for the two people who they were and their relationship at that point in time when they didn't have A Course in Miracles, they didn't have the lessons, they didn't have the whole text. Uh, you know, they were learning uh, on the job training, as they say. Mm -hmm. so, so it came to heal a relationship. And as Bill and Helen did the work of bringing it through and joining in this incredibly powerful common purpose that now enriches all of us, there was a significant healing of their relationship. Did it go as far as it could have and perhaps should have? Probably not. Um, we all have choice in this matter. You know, Helen, uh, I think she was very clear. I am faithful to bringing it through and I don't want, it, I don't want any part of it. And you know, for the rest of the world, that was probably a good thing. I mean, how easy it would have been for her to become, you know, the head of, the figurehead of a cult or something. Um, yeah, she needed to get out of its way and she knew it. Bill felt devastated by this. Um, you know, I, I knew Bill very well. And I remember once, you know, he didn't see him with tears in his eyes very often. And with tears, he was saying, this isn't how it was supposed to go. Well, obviously it was how it was supposed to go because this is how it went. Mm -hmm. But in his mind, they, 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 they work together as a holy relationship. Um, to transcend the ego. Bill wound up doing that with all of his other relationships. So, so it's all about relationship. And I think um, there's a line in the course, I think in chapter 15 somewhere, that says everyone has special relationships. If you think you're an exception and you don't have special relationships, you are probably more lost than the rest of us. Um, and that's saying something. Uh, not only do we all have special relationships, the point that I think we ultimately get to is all of our relationships, as the ego conceives of them, are special. We don't know what a holy relationship is, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like. We don't know because we have identified with the ego. And, and that's one of the central purposes of A Course in Miracles is to lead us in the direction where our relationships become so transformed that we um, begin to understand that holiness, that, uh, that we can't go without our brother and our brother can't go without us, and that Jesus can't, can't even do what he needs to do without all of us. But of course, he's already done that. So we've all already done that. And we're just playing out this crazy, you know, closed loop of time that we're stuck in. Um, you know, but, but so the relationship, the special relationship is everywhere. And in the second part of the book, which I think will, maybe you'll be kind enough to do uh, another one of these where we'll focus on that. Um, we work on it at, at the level of, you know, someone cut us off in the car and uh, well, that's a special relationship or we saw someone sitting in the lecture and we felt an attraction to them. Well, that's a special relationship. It's not good or bad. It's a learning opportunity. I, I, I think so many people misunderstand it, but where the essence lives, as with Bill and Helen, and where we tend to get our most profound and powerful lessons is in the special love relationship. 
Why? Because the ego has held that up as our savior. You know, if I can find the right woman, if someone finds the right male, female, or neuter person who just mirrors them absolutely perfectly, then you've achieved life's ultimate purpose. There's no more fear, there's no more hurt or pain. Isn't it wonderful? And I think, you know, most of us have had that experience to some extent for a little while because it can't last. It's, it's based on fumes, you know, it's based on fantasy. And the older we get, the more we can appreciate that and recognize it. But it's such heady stuff, it's such powerful stuff that we have to understand how it works in order to bring the Holy Spirit in and transform it. Um, I, I allude in the book, uh, I, think, I think, yeah, it's in some of the early chapters, because I've actually heard this from um, various course students of, yeah, and this is, you know, uh, male, uh, you know, cis male talking about woman he's lusting for. Um, I want to have a holy relationship with her, which essentially means, like, let's have sex and then do a course lesson. I'm sorry, that's not a holy relationship. You have an agenda. You know, you're, you're projecting all kinds of stuff out there. And a holy relationship is something very different. Could you do the course together? Absolutely. Do you have to? No. I think there are probably many, many, many holy relationships uh, between people who don't even ha have no clue what A Course in Miracles is. But this is an exquisite path for getting there. And, and it does it in so many different ways. So we start, and the first part of my book starts by looking at the special love relationship and all of its um, pseudo glory and all that ultimately uh, undermines it and makes sure it's not gonna work. And that said, I still understand how powerful it is. Uh, as I write in, uh, in the book, you know, I, I started doing A Course in Miracles at age 20, um, shortly before medical school. I dove in in a big way. I would say after four or five years of studying the course, I was sitting in study groups with people, you know, three times my age and uh, including, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists. And yeah, I knew the course better than they did, except, gee, I still really wanted that special relationship. You know, um, sometimes you got to have the McDonald's burger to realize that there's better food in life than a McDonald's burger. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> McDonald's. Uh, you know, no slight intended. <clears throat> so, so, yeah, it exerts a hold on us, and we can't just forswear it and go, all right, that's it. I'm declaring myself celibate. Um, you know, I don't want to... No, you know, you, you work this stuff by confronting it. And the beauty of relationship is if, if you're really working it, it's guaranteed to bring up the worst, ugliest, deepest darknesses in you that you never wanted to face. Never. You know, I mean, I've done my share of psychotherapy, training therapy, before that, regular psychotherapy. I went into marriage thinking, uh, I know all of this. And marriage brings up stuff, and then you have children. My God, does that bring up stuff. Suddenly, uh, you know, you find yourself behaving exactly as your parents did, which you swore that would never happen to you. Well, that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to go deep, and it's a forgiveness opportunity. Uh, so, so relationships are, you know, are really the key. Um, I'm curious, were there any, you know, parts in those, you know, first four or five chapters that you wanted to focus on in a more um, focused way. Yeah, there, there, there certainly are. Uh, before I do, uh, there, there's one thing you, you mentioned about special love relationships that it kind of triggered, got a little aha moment there. And that is, and sometimes I, I catch myself doing that when I have special love, uh, relationships around not only just specific people, but also uh, specific uh, situations or outcomes or yes. you know, anything from, you know, it could be a health situation to a financial situation to a social situation, you know, any, anything that's that I could say, I'd rather have this outcome than that outcome and have some kind of, like you say, an agenda or an attachment to it. 
that's if what what occurred to me is that if we could you know certainly with the realm of people if we if we could say i want this holy relationship and if we could substitute any person in the world <laughs> that would be a good test perhaps of of the of how how far we've come in terms of generalization anyway just kind of crossed my mind that might be an interesting absolutely you know, interesting test there yeah well, you know, there's, yeah. there's that absolutely um, brilliant, powerful line. Again, I think it's chapter 15, could be earlier, about you cannot love uh, except as God loves. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, if you reserve special, or, and, and then in the special love section, you know, if you're reserving special love for one person to the exclusion of anybody else, you're not loving as God loves because God doesn't see specialness. You know, specialness was was the ego's um, ingenious invention to substitute for God's love. Don't look at that love stuff over there. No, no, no. Look at this. Look at this shiny object. Here's what you can have. You know, you can have this in your relationship, and then who needs God? Um, but it doesn't work. And, and I actually think this is one of the reasons why a lot of course students are at the uh, older end of the uh, demographic life spectrum, because you sort of have to have gone through a lot of stuff to realize that you know, relationship or career or fame and fortune or making a, a whole ton of money, that, that these things really don't get you what you want. And you can watch people captive to this, still running in the hamster wheel. I mean, I'm thinking right now of uh, Mike Bloomberg, who's, you know, running for president and sinking a hundred million or more dollars into this effort. It's like, so you, here's a guy who's got enough money to do anything he wanted in the world. I mean, you know, he could start a research university. He could, uh, he, he could, he could support spiritual, I mean, anything, mm -hmm. but no, it's like, you know, he's got the fame, he's got the fortune, but there's some other aspiration in there, you know, um, Room on the trophy shelf. Yeah, <laughs> room on the trophy shelf. I always think of that song, The Bear Went Over the Mountain, you know, to see what he could find. And what did he find? He found another mountain. Uh, <laughs> what did he do? He climbed the other mountain. And, you know, we're all just bears trying to get over the mountain. And then we see another mountain. Oh, I think I better climb that one too. And then the Sisyphus myth uh, kicks in and we realize, I need to generalize here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> that stone is going to roll down the hill and I'm going to do it all over again. Exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Whether it's one mountain or multiple mountains, uh, they all come to the same uh, pile of dirt. Yeah, <laughs> and they can change their shape and size and, and oh, appearance yeah. dramatically, but it's it's still the, the, the same principle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so how do we go off on that particular tangent i don't recall oh i was just i was thinking about the generalizing you know oh, yeah, and, 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 and yet, you know, being able to you know as you say over time you know i think it's easier to generalize when when you look at uh, a series of relationships that we you know each of us have had as we as we get older we you know tend to start noticing some patterns and say oh yeah that that, <laughs> that same unconscious unfounded guilt was still still there and i still wasn't resolved when i went from you know this to that to that to that to that you know whether it's a romantic relationship or a job or a, you know a place to live or or your health regimen or you know all, all the different things that people make specialness uh, objects out of right so yeah and we set these up so yeah. that there's always like this you know shining hope in the future the city on the hill we're not there now but we'll get there someday but the problem is you get to one mountain as i said and then there's another one you you don't get there when you achieve it it's no longer satisfying because that is the nature of the ego you know the, the great line that's repeated many times in the text you know the ego's motto is seek but do not find loves the idea that we're searching the ego does um but no it's not going to let us find anything because when we find the one destination the one goal that truly will satisfy which is awakening to our true identity as god's child we don't need the ego anymore i mean it's at that point it's gone you know so can the i, I know i wrote this somewhere in in the book can can the ego support a process that is ultimately um, guaranteed to destroy the ego? Um, it, it won't, it can't, mm -hmm. you know.
Uh, but we have something else in us, the Holy Spirit, that will not destroy the ego. It'll just awaken us to the fact that the ego is poof, you know, a bad dream. You know, nobody wakes up and goes, wow, I'm glad I blew that dream to smithereens. No, we just go, oh, really glad that wasn't real. <laughs> mm-hmm. Doesn't doesn't require a militia or or armaments or or, or even a nuke to <laughs> to get rid of what never was. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, how about if I, I jump to some of the things that I particularly resonated with in, in your writing? Yeah. Um, here, here's a quote from page 59, uh, where you say, ideally, it wants to return to oneness, but it no longer remembers the way back, it being uh, our, our mind, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, furthermore, this new, quote, I, unquote, has its own agenda. Uh, it dis- disdains oneness because it knows it can never achieve it. It wants something better than oneness, something more special than love, something that will justify its decision to separate. This, quote, I, unquote, this new self, is, of course, the ego. If you really were an ego and nothing else, there would be no hope of ever returning to oneness. But that's not the case. You can't change the nature of what God created you to be. You can only dream that you've changed, and in that dream, believe that you've become something else, something you're not and could never be. As long as you stay asleep, you will believe your dream is real. Your dream of separation makes the ego real for you. And I thought that was particularly astute. Maybe you'd like to comment on that or give some examples and or, you know, well, riff you know, off of that somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, you know, to me, that is the essence of, of the ego and of the atonement. If we conceptualize ourselves as separate from each other with our own, you know, unique body structures, our own unique personalities, our own unique history, you know, what happened to me didn't happen to Bruce, what happened to Bruce didn't happen to me, and on and on, then, you know, we might find some commonalities. Hey, we both have done stuff for the Foundation for Inner Peace. How cool. Let's form a club. Um, you know, but we will never, ever be able to really join in, in you know, that perfect union, uh, so to speak. The ego cannot do it. Um, and knowing that it can't do it, it doesn't face that and go, wow, I really screwed up. I must be dreaming. Let me wake up. We can do that, but not the ego. As we were saying before, the ego is going to send us on an endless uh, series of searches for the specialness that will make everything, that will justify separation, that will prove that it's good. But what, you know, what the Course tells us is... I am as God created me. You know, the only lesson that's repeated three times and then three more times in the reviews, six times total. Why is that? Because it's bedrock. You can't change the nature of what you are. And instead of experiencing that with a tantrum, what do you mean I can't change what I am? You know, I have free will, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you have free will to do with what's going on in here. You have free will to make a choice of whether you want to return or chase after more fool's gold, but you don't have free will when it comes to what you are. I mean, this is what the introduction to A Course in Miracles tell, is telling us. You know, you, you don't get to choose the curriculum. You can only elect what you want to take at a given time. <laughs> so understood properly, that is the atonement. The atonement is nothing happened. You can't change it. All of your fever dreams weren't real. Anything you thought you did in that past life where you were Hitler, where you were, you know, Genghis Khan and slaughtered billions and raped and pillaged. um, Yeah, you might need in your own mind, out of your own guilt, to do some penance or whatever, but not in God's mind. In God's mind, none of that even happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's a very difficult thing for people to get around. And I actually do address the whole you know, what about Hitler problem, which you hear in every course group. I I do address that in part two of the book. So let's reserve that for, for a later discussion. Um, But, you know, um, the point being, you are what God created you to be. You always were, you always will be, you already have returned. 
And if we can embrace the complete safety and certainty of that, our life here, it, it, you know, will we'll just work so much better. You'll still have challenges because there are obstacles there that I promise you, you aren't even aware of yet. You know, there's a purification process that starts with the most obvious and leaches its way down to deeper and deeper levels of beliefs and patterns and subroutines that, that we're not even aware of. And we shouldn't be aware of them until we're really ready to face them and clear them. You know, don't say to the Holy Spirit, bring it on, dude, because he won't. He, he's not going to do anything that's going to plunge you into fear or despair or make you feel like there's too much. There's only one entity that's going to tell you, yeah, go do it. No pain, no gain. And that's the ego. And when you identify that, you've just identified another behavior or subroutine pattern that you need to release and let go. Um, you know, it's very hard for us to understand that we don't know the way back, but we have within us a God, capital G, who does. So yeah, I think that that section you read, um, you know, I, I find some of my book very repetitive and I faulted myself for it. On the other hand, my wife keeps telling me, no, it needs to be repetitive. Look at the course. It's, you know, it's intensely repetitive because we need to hear these ideas over and over again in different, you know, variations and forms. Um, and I think that's what the course is so brilliant at doing. Um, what else? Anything else in there? Yeah. I'm not hearing you, Bruce. I think you're. Are you oh, muted? thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, Start over. <laughs> we, we had uh, some some noise ambient noise i wanted to mute out so um yeah that the rep repetition reminds me of a metaphor that that uh, crossed my mind the other day and that is uh, you know a gps that we use and take for granted um nowadays you know uses repetition it's also a great metaphor for the holy spirit and that it, it keeps guiding us back to where we need to go without having to uh you know resort to being you know uh Say, say, oh, you, you, you jerk! You, you messed, messed up that that turn or whatever. You, you know, it does. It's not, it's not that kind of a, uh, a system. It's fortunately, it's very, very forgiving and just it always gets us to back to the quickest path to get on course. But the other yeah. thing that that uh, I think is cool about the GPS that's, that's sort of a nerdy technical thing is the signal that the GPS locks onto from the satellites that are uh, in the Earth's atmosphere is actually quieter by quite a bit, well, I think an order of magnitude or two, quieter than the actual noise that the receiver gets. So if you remember back to your AM radio days, the, you know, turning between uh, stations on the dial, you'd hear all the staticky noise. Well, if you can imagine, imagine that a, a GPS receiver in your phone or in, in the, the dash of your car is actually listening to a signal that's quieter than the background noise that, that its radio is picking up. And the only way it, it is able to lock onto that signal is by repetition. It looks for a very specific pattern over and over and over again until it, it builds up that signal and, and locks onto it. So I think that's kind of a good metaphor for, for how our, our, our you know, internal guidance system, if you will, the, whole, the, the whole course calls the Holy Spirit is, is uh, sort of analogous an analogous way, uh, you know, basically through repetition of noticing the special relationships, noticing uh, the desire to make, um, you know, a, a substitution for what only our creator can provide the, the uh, you know, the all that craziness um, and, and ultimately silliness really then uh, is overcome by repeating the forgiveness classroom uh, in all this countless you know, variations over and over again, it would seem. Well, we can't learn anything without practice. Exactly. I love that metaphor of, okay, yeah. the signal that turns out to be the most powerful in guiding us is quieter than all the noise that we use to distract mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to be receptive to it. You know, we, we have to, in a sense, ask for it or look for it. But when we do, there it is. Exactly. And yes, I love, you know, I always, I like to joke, you know, your GPS will never shame you for making the wrong turn. Exactly. You, know? you exactly. idiot, how could you do that? I told you seven times. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which, which brings us to another really wonderful section, and I'm probably further on in the book as well, but uh, the, uh, the compass of shame that you talk about, with, which uh, I guess one of your colleagues uh, introduced you to, I thought some of the ideas in that are wonderful. I mean, there was other things that I jotted down in the, in the earlier uh, portions of the book, but uh, in particular, that section really appealed to me and, and 
the fact that you, you know, were able to apply that in your uh, psychotherapy practice uh, and, and bring that to, to bear in, in a way that I think a lot of course students would find really helpful too. So maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, I'm, really glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. And we did talk about that before we went on air. And um, I could have just happily talked all about it. And at the end gone, ah, we never covered uh, the topic of shame. So I, you know, because of my um, psychiatric training, I have a, a particular take on the course's use of, of guilt. And I explain this in the book. It, it's sort of an artifact of when Helen and Bill, Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford um, were alive. You know, they, the course was, uh, was, was described, taken down pretty much in the 1960s, 1965 through 1972. Um, and in that time, in psychology, it was all Freudian psychoanalysis. I mean, nothing else. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah, you had Jungians, and they were looked at as, as like weird pariahs. You know, you had Adlerians. I mean, there were these different little spin-offs, But without question, Freudian psychoanalytic thinking was the dominant player in the world of psycho psychiatry anyway, psychology a little less so. And in the world of, uh, in that world at the time, guilt was huge. I mean, there were thousands of papers on guilt. Shame, by contrast, was barely recognized. And we say that shame is the emotion that likes to hide. It needs to hide. Shame, you know, when, when you're in shame, what do you do? Uh, you know, you hide your face and you turn away. You don't want to be seen. You want to crawl in a hole. Well, the whole study of shame essentially did that and left the field open to guilt. But the two are, you know, they're sort of, you know, evil twins in a way. And when the course talks about guilt, I've been aware for a long time that it's also talking about shame. Uh, it just didn't have the word to use because that word wasn't in Helen's lexicon at the time. You know, shame didn't really come into its own in the popular imagination until John Bradshaw in the 1980s. Now there were people studying it, like my, uh, my mentor who I referenced in the book earlier, but even then, I mean, he wasn't giving courses at the American Psychiatric Association until the 90s. Mm. So it couldn't have come in, but here, here's the, um, you know, sort of the, the, the elevator pitch, if you will. Guilt is about something we did that we feel bad about and regret. Shame is about what we think we are. So shame is about the self, guilt is about what that self does. Guilt, as A Course in Miracles would see it, actually is primary because the first thing we did was we thought, we believed we separated from God. Now that wasn't really an action as we think of actions as bodies take them, but you know, we, <laughs> we, we thought we killed God by separating from God and therefore we erect all of these crazy defenses and we come into a world of separation and then we project that guilt outward because we can't bear to stand it. And now we see this whole world of illusion and dream and we make it real to further keep us from the guilt. So the course is correct. I mean, guilt is primary, but in terms of how we experience it, and I know sometimes I'll read those sections and go, well, I don't feel terribly guilty about the separation. Um, you know, I'm just trying to live my life and make enough money and go on vacation or what have you. But when you then look at shame, shame is the fundamental conviction that we are not enough in some way. You know, you're inferior mentally. Your body doesn't look or do what you want. You know, you can't compete at that high level the girl or boy next to you is prettier and has more friends. Nobody can grow up without shame because the, the self, the ego self concept is that fragile. Going through school, I don't care if you're the most popular boy or girl on the planet, if you are, you're on a very tricky precipice because you could topple off of that at any moment and then someone else is the most popular boy or girl on the planet. So shame is, it's literally endemic. I mean, it, it lives within us and, um, and is ever present, but because it's an emotion that hides, we don't recognize it. And in the book, what I lay out is not just that understanding of shame and how the ego is ipso facto shameful and shame bound, 
and therefore will do anything to distract us from that core shame. But the ways in which um, the, the defenses against shame, and this is, we call this uh, in, in the school of psychotherapy that I come from, the compass of shame, because it lines up these defenses along two axes. One is all about attack, and we all know the course talks a great deal about attack, um, but attack comes from scarcity, it comes from shame. Um, and you can easily offload that, that shame by attacking someone else or by attacking yourself. Oh, look at what a schmuck I am, I can't believe it. You know, I am just the worst, lowest worm in the world, open parentheses, and if I can bring that forward before you attack me, then at least I have some control over what's gonna to happen to me. And the other axis is about withdrawal and avoidance. It's more complicated to get into, but these are, you know, sort of, withdrawal is easy. We already talked about it. Oh my God, I can't believe what I did. I'm gonna go hide and, you know, wait till the storm passes and the dust settles. Um, Richard Nixon's a great example of that. You know, tricky dick, I'm not a criminal. And he resigns and we don't hear much about Nick, you know, he gets pardoned. We don't hear much about Nixon for those who weren't alive at the time. Um, and then a couple years later, you know, he pops his head out and he starts making comments here and there. And before you know it, the most disgraced person in American history kind of gets back his statesman status. Um, because shame is short lived and we all move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, so, you know, that's the most natural response to shame. Avoidance is, is what we, um, is a defense that we use for all of those ways that basically allow us to say, shame? Nah, no shame here, I feel perfectly fine. So it includes narcissism, it includes substance abuse of all varieties, and uh, you know, I don't think we have the time uh, or the space for me to go into all of that, um, but I, I, I do, uh, you know, I, I do open it up and uh, discuss it um, in, in, in those chapters in, in the book. But I think as course students, you know, there, there are many places where it's very clear, bring all that is within you, all the darkness to the Holy Spirit, bring illusion to the truth. Um, I believe that in a more, um, how to put it, practical and operational way, what it's telling us is your shame is the glue that helps to hold your false self-concept together. And if you can look at it, you can begin to dissolve those bonds of that glue. And when you do, not only does the shame go away, because the cure for shame is exposure in the safe setting of love, not only does your shame go away, but you start to discover that the self that's really there is so much more resplendent and loving than any self-concept you can put together that you become really motivated to, oh yeah, there's, there's more shame. Oh good, let me, you know, let me, let me work on this. Um, it's not by coincidence that 12-step groups are so powerful um, and such an entryway to spirituality because what they're saying is, yeah, as a drunk, as a you know, uh, gambling addict, as a sex addict, what have you, we're all the same in this room. Um, and that there's a commonality in that, that that begins to undermine the shame that drives the addictive behavior. You know, what's an addictive behavior? An addictive behavior is a behavior that says, oh, when I get to this point, I have an experience that protects me from the raw shame of my being. My cocaine high, my alcoholic drunk, um, my you know, hot sex with the person who picked me up in whatever circumstance, um, the horse that just won the race that I made a whole ton of money on. You know, these are experiences that temporarily infuse the ego with a sense of grandiosity. Uh, I really am king of the world. And you know, yeah, lasts for a little while, uh, not very long, mm -hmm. and then you gotta go do it again, and then you gotta do it again, and the outcome gets less and less and less satisfying over time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly, yeah, hey, on, on that note, when, since you touched on narcissism, I was, I was thinking about uh, 
the comment that was made that I thought was brilliant that, you know, the, everyone's ego is, 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 you know, a narcissist and, yes. and uh, yeah, 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 that's about, about right. And, and just as a, as a, a temporal reference, uh, we're, re we're recording this conversation and uh, during the week in, in which our, our current president was uh, uh, the impeachment uh, proceedings were brought to the Senate uh, uh, this week. And I was thinking, well, I, I try to remind myself that no matter what political figure or, or whatever, you know, crosses your mind, but this seems like a, a particularly handy one. Uh, it's like, this is a reminder that I'm really looking at my projection of narcissism. Um, and whenever, whenever I am tempted to make any kind of judgments or whatever, I, I need to look at my own uh, you know, narcissism and wanting to make this specific self um, more important than all the other seemingly separate specific selves in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to, just to, to realize, you know, that, that not only is that a daunting assignment, but fortunately we, we all have that inner kindness teacher, AKA Holy Spirit to, to you know, draw uh, support from, to, to look at that and to, to look at the shame. And, and as you were saying, you know, watch it dissolve um, yeah. with that guidance and with that support. So. Yeah. I mean, for most, most people understand what narcissism is. I mean, the term comes from the Greek myth of Narcissus, who um, is, you know, basically entranced by, I, I think, uh, some, some sprite or, you know, God who wants to, him to love them, to fall in love with the first thing he sees, and he bends over a stream to take a sip of water and sees his reflection and falls in love with it. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is, we think of it as self-love, and when we run into a narcissistic person, we tend to react to them as, oh, they think they're so much better than we are, and they trigger our shame, uh, you know, because they seem to be so full of themselves. But when we understand narcissism is kind of the, the ultimate attempt at defending against shame, mm -hmm. you know, I can't look at any of my shame. I have to pretend I am so perfect and so good uh, that, you know, I'm not, I'm not dealing with any of it. Then we can actually start to have some compassion because we all do come from uh, exactly that place. Mm -hmm. You know, as you said, uh, the ego is a narcissist. It has to be. It's only got its own self-interest at heart. You know, it's funny. I was going to use a particular poem of um, Percy Bysshe Shelley's in this book. And then I remembered I'd used it already in From Plagues to Miracles. So I couldn't, com uh, couldn't repeat it. But it's um, his famous poem, Ozymandias, which just deals with narcissism and, uh, and the ego's inf self-inflation so beautifully where you know a traveler in the desert comes upon these two stubs of of like you know feet and ankles uh, with this plaque saying you know here is Osmandius king of kings you know and the, the the actual statue has been toppled and and the face down in the sand and it's kind of like yeah you know this great king of kings erected this this statue to his magnificence and here it is however many centuries later and nobody's heard of him, and his statue has gone to dust, and some you know, traveler wandering the desert pauses for a brief moment to take it in and then moves on. That's the ego. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's how much narcissism will get you. Narcissism is that statue. Or another great metaphor, which I think I do use in the book, is the Wizard of Oz. You know, don't look at that man behind the curtain. You know, I am the great and powerful Oz. Well, the great and powerful Oz is the front, uh, the narcissistic front for the shameful, um, completely bumbling and incompetent pseudo wizard behind the curtain. And we all have that guy behind the curtain inside of us. Absolutely. I, I love the Wizard of Oz metaphors and uh, uh, Jackie Laura Jones uses a lot of them. In, Jackie in, in, in loves them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, there's one in particular that, that I, I think is, is it, it, actually a good pun that really relates to uh, a lot of the course uh, ideas of, in, of total inclusion. And that is the name of Dorothy's dog that pulls back the curtain is Toto. And oh, we yeah. have to see in Toto <laughs> the depth and the breadth of, of our insanity. Uh, but we, you know, usually we see it in little, little segments, but, but ultimately we have to see it in Toto. <laughs> right? That's great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anything else you want to say about the, um, 
the 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 compass of shame or or some of the, some of the variants that that uh, you know you you've run across in your practice over the years or things like that? Well, I think the one thing I would want to leave um, our viewers with is, is this idea that well, two ideas. One, attack is never justified. Uh, and the reason it's never justified is because it's never about the other person. It's always about our idea of the other person. And our idea of the other person in turn rests on our idea of ourself, which goes back to shame. So it's the idea that attack is never justified and that when we attack, we are necessarily attacking ourself first. Um, I go into this more in the second part of the book about grievances, but think of it this way. If the goal of all attack is to divert you from the learning that you need to do in order to expose the darkness within you and bring it to the light, which is the last chapter of part one, um, then by attacking, you are preserving the darkness. You are making a conscious choice to preserve it. Um, you are not only preserving it, you are amplifying it because you are probably uh, sparking shame and counterattack in the other person. And, and we kind of get lost in the weeds. So if we're ever going to find our way out and follow you know, that Holy Spirit's GPS, we have to um, see attack in a very different way. Um, as I use in the book, we have to reframe it. Uh, and understand it as as a learning opportunity, you know, as as, as lesson uh, what is it, you know, one ninety three says, all things are lessons God would have me learn. Um, so when we're tempted to attack, or if we do attack, we want to be able to pull back and go, huh, what was that about? What aspect of my self concept got so triggered? that I needed to project it out and attack it in the form of my brother. And once I get there, I can be filled with compassion for him and for me. This is the key. It's like we want to be compassionate for, compassionate for both sides of the equation, for exactly. the entire relationship. Um, and you know, as the Course tells us, uh, everything that a brother brings to us is either an expression of love or uh, a calling out for love. And either way, the only response that, that matters is, is love. So in a sense, when we attack, um, we are crying out for love. And we want to be able to recognize it as a call for love and then say, okay, well, where does that love come from? Does it come from the other person? No, not ultimately. I mean, it might come through them and express, but it has to be our willingness to allow ourselves to be loved, which is the essence of what we are, through the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is holding the love that you are in such perfection um, that all you need to do is open to it. And that turns out to have so much resistance and so many little hurdles that we go through that we only take it in bit by bit. But that's okay, um, because as long as we are doing that, we're using time for the only purpose it has, to go home, capital H, go home, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and beginning to wake up. You know, um, love which created me is what I am. You know, uh, so attack can be completely revisioned, if you will, as an opportunity for forgiveness for yourself and for the other person. Exactly. Beautifully said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it really is, you know, you know, we're all in the same boat. We're all, you know, fighting the same hard battle and, and, and that compassion is so important and, and, you know, just catching ourselves in that, what of course calls the attack defense cycle, you know, then of course guilt is, you know, what, fuels the whole crazy go around <laughs> and just watching and say oh there I go again and 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 then uh, recognizing you know with practice it's like oh I could respond with loving kindness to my call for love which I see projected out whether it's across the room across the freeway across the country whatever it's that's that's really my call for love and it's everyone's call for love at the same time yeah exactly and and not you know not linking it to any particular outcome mm -hmm. you know you might be ready to love and the other person isn't. And uh, 
you know you have to respect that yeah um because yeah. if you fall back into attack you're you're not making things better um, yeah so that kind of includes the the uh, the willingness to not be attached to outcomes and and uh, and recognize that as the course you know I keep reminding myself it's always and only about the mind and never about behavior or form right. and and if I can oh. remember that <laughs> more and more often with repetition <laughs> I can uh, you know find more peace so which I think you got it brother <laughs> speaks to the heart of what the the course keeps saying and and you you've been you know sharing beautifully and and just the first part of the book that I've read that this, this latest book so anything else you want to add I think I think we've I think we're probably at a good, uh, you know, sort of wrapping up point. Okay. Um, the only other sort of practical thing is that you're reading um, a PDF version of it. So your page numbers are not going to line up with the page numbers oh, in the okay. published book. Okay. So okay. That's... Someone's trying to find a quote based on your page number. Good to note. Yes. Yeah, Thank you for that. Yes. Be able to do it. Yes. Um, at this point I do have, you know, the, the galleys of the actual book so I could, you know, if we want, uh, if you want to, I, I could look up the, the real page number and get it to you to put up with oh, the okay, okay. whatever, okay. but um, just so people know that. Um, that so would that be, that'd be helpful, actually. Yeah, if you, if you have an opportunity, I'll, I'll send you the quotes that I, that I referred okay. to, we did, which we didn't cover all of them. And, I, and it was just a fraction, tiny fraction of the wonderful things I was reading. I, I mean, it really, it was all great. <laughs> well, we'll, do our, we'll, so, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap, maybe, you know, we can pick them up the next time. Okay, yeah, very good, very good. Well, anyway, thank you so much, Bob. I always enjoy our conversations and load with uh, great insights and helpful information and I highly encourage uh, everyone to get a copy with, of your new book when it comes out on February 4th now that I know the, the correct date um, from loving one to one love uh, right so I'm trying That's to get it. it backwards yeah okay <laughs> relationships through a course in miracles exactly exactly so um, I'll put this up on acimblog.com and uh, send you the link and uh, looking forward to the next conversation Thanks so much. I will look forward to it too. As you say, I always enjoy these and, um, and uh, yeah, let's do more. Great. Thanks so much. Bye for Thank now. You.